come on, stand to our feet. Who's thankful to be in the house of the Lord today? Jesus, you're good. Well, I was buried beneath my shame. We just want to declare the name Jesus over our lives, over our families, over our destinies, believing in the hope in the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. In Him is life. In Him is power. In Him is life everlasting. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over
over every heart and every mind Cause I know there is peace within your presence I speak Jesus I just want to speak the name of Jesus Till every dark addiction starts to break Declaring there is hope and there is freedom I speak Jesus Cause your name is power Your name is healing Your name is life Break every stronghold Shine through the shadows For every enemy And Jesus for my family I speak the holy name Jesus Oh, shout Jesus from the mountains Jesus in the streets Jesus in the darkness Oh, for every enemy So 
over our lives hallelujah Cause your name is power your name is healing your name is life yes it is break every stronghold shine through the shadows burn like a fire Come on, declare. Your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn light. The Lord is here, amen. He promises that when two or three are gathered in his name, he is there. We thank you for your presence, God. He's with you right there in your seats. Thank you, Lord. Caught up in your presence I just want to sit here at your feet I'm caught up in this holy moment I never want to leave Oh, I here for blessings Jesus you don't owe me anything more than anything that you can do I just want you and I'm sorry when I've just gone through the motions I'm sorry When I just sang another song Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm sorry When I've come with my agenda, I'm sorry When I forgot that you're enough Take me back to where we started I open up my heart to you I'm caught up in your presence for that. 
just want you Nothing else Nothing else Nothing else will do I just want you Nothing else And nothing else presence right now. Jesus, you're good. Jesus, you're good. Oh, his presence is here. Just take a moment like Mary said at the feet of Jesus. Not in a rush, but just to spend time in His presence.
declaration that you're laying down your life for Jesus to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you no matter the cost Jesus to worship you I live to worship you I live I live to worship you You'd make us a house of worship. reaches out to everyone who desires everyone to be saved and help us in this time when we hear your word let it speak deeply to our heart and to our souls and help us be fully devoted representative witnesses of you as we walk through this life let there be healing come from heaven for those among us who are afflicted in any and every way. Let there be empowerment of the Holy Spirit. Equip us to live our lives for you every day. And we thank you for it, Father. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you. Hallelujah. What a beautiful day it is. You may be seated. It's so good to come together and to feel the refreshment of the presence of the Lord. If you're here and don't know Jesus, this, this is your day. God has you here for a purpose. The Bible says all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And so it's really up to you. If you'll respond to God, you'll find him waiting. In just a few moments, uh, we're going to bring our tithe and offerings to worship God and promote the work of his kingdom here on earth. While the ushers are coming and you prepare for that, let me just say welcome Welcome to Crossroads. If this is your first time, we thank you for coming. And we want to just do everything we can to let you know that we would love to have you be a part of our body. Out in the atrium, the foyer, there's a place called Connection Point. And there you can find out information, uh, ask any question you want. It'll be a pleasure for people who are there to serve you. There's something great for kids and youth. And I, I, was, I was listening in on a conversation just this morning 
150 to 200 youth gathered, and it was powerful. And we need to be involved in that. And we think, and, and by the way, I also heard a good report. Uh, a lot of our children went to something called uh, Junior Bible Quiz. And I don't know, there were several, there were scores of kids from Crossroads who were there. And they were so excited because even though they are new at this process, uh, all of our kids, uh, there was, there was a power team there that just blew everybody else away. But all of our kids always came in second, third, or fourth among scores of kids who were there. And they were celebrating that. It is good to involve your children in the things of the Lord. And you can find out about that, those kinds of things. In fact, right now, last week, today, and next week, uh, you can find a, a place in 75 to 100 different small groups that are meeting. Uh, they have the information on two different uh, uh, stations out in the atrium, and we want to see you get plugged in so that your life can be enriched with Jesus Christ. Isn't it wonderful to be a follower of Jesus Christ? Can you, do you agree with that? Can you <laughs> shout hallelujah or something? <laughs> Lord, right now, again, I pause to thank you. Lord, I thank you that you're the God who provides. And Lord, thank you for the promises of your word. We come worshiping you, supporting the work of your kingdom. Let the promises of God rest upon your people. And we give you praise and thank you for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you.
Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Isn't he good, church? Thank you all for worshiping with us today. You may be seated. That is just one of my favorite bumpers that we, we, we've done. Uh, one, I love the music to it. It just kind of hits me right. And two, I love that Jesus provides direction. If you're looking for direction, you can get direction in a lot of places. But many of the places you get direction from, you may not want to get direction from, right? Uh, and so, so we're, we're going we're gonna to try to, to do that today. Uh, I want to take a second and welcome everybody here. I, I know you've already been welcome. Uh, welcome everybody in East Windsor. It's great to have you with us today. We're, we're so excited to be with you and everybody who's joining us uh, online. Wherever you're at today, if you have your Bibles, would you take them, whether they're digital, paperback, whatever that looks like, and open them to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2. We're going to be continuing in our series, walking through the book of Philippians today. And then if uh, those of you who want to be ahead... We're going to spend uh, the second part of our message today looking at um, uh, Psalm 73. My brain was clicking there a little bit. Uh, You ever do that? It just kind of, uh, David, Psalm, there it is, Psalm Psalm 73. So if you want to uh, find that ahead of time, we're going to spend a a good portion uh, today. There's there's something that David says that that ties into uh, something that Paul says uh, here in Philippians, but maybe maybe you found your way uh, already. Uh, let me begin by saying, Martin Luther once said, the Son of God does not want to be seen and found in heaven. Therefore, he descended from heaven to this earth, and he came to us in our flesh. He placed himself inside the womb of his mother, and then in her lap, and then on a cross. Um, that's, if you were here with us last week, if you were following along with this message series last week, you already know that's kind of a picture uh, said in a different way of what we saw last week 
of what Paul was writing as he wrote to the church there at Philippi as we were pondering Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. That kind of tells the story just really quickly. Uh, talking about how Jesus humbled himself. Do you remember? You remember how Jesus humbled himself again and again and again? Jesus, the one who was accustomed to having angels always bow in his presence and, and singing, holy, holy, holy are you, Lord. Jesus, that Jesus relaxed his grip on all of the divine prerogatives that he normally enjoyed. He, the Bible tells us that he, he emptied himself of everything that would keep him from becoming just like us in every way except without sin. Scripture tells us he took on the appearance of a man and the likeness of a man, and he, he became a bond servant. He came uh, uh, to, not to be served, but to serve us in every way. It tells us that the omnipotent God of this universe humbled himself, and he served people all around him. He teaches people day and night. He heals, he feeds, he serves, he washes, he washes feet. He embraces lepers. He embraces children. And then he humbles himself by subjecting himself to the enemy called death. And now the life giver, the one who when, when he speaks, worlds are formed and life begins. The life giver now submits to the life taker. And he, he doesn't just experience any ordinary death, but but he experiences the horrible, horrible, humiliating death of the cross, the most vile form of execution. Why? For your sin. Because you have sinned. Every, everyone who's sitting in seats here, everyone who's sitting in seats uh, in East Windsor, you may be sitting in, in your home right now. He died because of your sin, and he died because of my sin. Yes, amen. Because... I sinned, and, and my sin, the Bible tells us, has a punishment that's carried with it called death and eternal separation from God. He follows the Father's plan of downward mobility in his life, and we owe our salvation to his willingness to, instead of take an upward mobile track, to take a downward mobile track and to submit himself even to death. And now... Because the Father has once again exalted him to the highest place. Now, from his exalted position, sitting at the right hand of the Father, now he says, the Apostle Paul echoes this in, in his letter, he says, have the same attitude in you that I had when I stepped out of heaven and came to serve you. Have that same mindset in you. Have that same value system yearn in your spirit to follow that same kind of humbling path where, where you're not about trying to get accolades for yourself or to protect yourself in, in what you have, but, but have the attitude that says you're going to step out of whatever you think you deserve and, and, and go out and serve people who are around you. Have the mindset to, to bring God glory and advance the cause of Christ. Jesus says, follow me, and as you follow me in that way, then I'm going to honor you in the same way that I was honored. In this, you advance the kingdom of God. There is no other way to be great in God's eyes but to find God's downward path for your life where, where you have been called to humbly serve uh, people who are a part of this world. There's no other way to honor God but to find God's path in doing that and then to walk in it. When we talk about those kinds of things, we're, we're at the very heart of the Christian message. What, what has propelled the church of Jesus Christ for 2,000 years has not been a message of health. It's not been a message of health and happiness and, and, and those kinds of things. It has not been an upwardly mobile message that, uh, that, that has kept the cause of Christ uh, alive in the world around us for 2,000 years. Uh, it has not been seeking, seeking God for personal gain or for some quick spiritual high or quick spiritual good feeling that you're going to get by going here and seeing this or experiencing this and, oh, I just feel good in it. That is not what advances the cause of Christ. The substance of the gospel of Jesus is realizing that we have all sinned and then turning and trusting Jesus for forgiveness. And then 
Not stopping there. Never, ever stopping there. But next, turning and taking on the same mindset that Jesus, our Savior, had when he came to provide forgiveness for us. You see, we are not saved just so that we can be saved. We are saved so that we can then serve others. That's the mind of Christ. Now, let's pretend for just a moment that all of us who heard that message last week in uh, all of us who read that uh, in Philippians uh, 2 ver- through, uh, verses 5 through 11, let's pretend that all of us were deeply moved. Let, let's pretend that we all collectively decided that we're going to commit ourselves to understanding specifically how God is calling me, specifically how God is calling you to go out and, and, and walk that downward mobility path where we're serving others, where we find that spot where we're giving, not just taking, but we're giving to serve others. And, and we each have decided that we've committed ourselves that, that if not today, uh, in the days that are ahead, we're going to find our place to be serving the body of Christ, building up others and and encouraging others and giving of ourselves. Let's pretend that we all got really excited about that and and, and we're all going to move forward. Paul would say, listen, that is fantastic. That is awesome. Imagine what will happen in the church uh, and in the world if all of us did that, if, if all of us did that kind of thing. Paul would say, look out world. Paul would say, now, now you're getting to where I'm at, where I have, I have given my life to the cause of advancing uh, the cause of Jesus Christ. Look out, world, because some amazing things are going to happen. That, that's where Paul, Paul would be like, we're, we're ready to go now. We're ready to, we're ready to rock and roll. We're ready, we're ready to move, right? But Paul is going to say in this section coming up here now today, even if all of you do that, and, and that would be awesome if we all did, Here's what you need to know now. I'm going to tell you something now because you're going to run into this. And some of you have already run into this because you've, you've already been committed in, you know, in the past or, or currently. Somewhere along the path of that journey of following Jesus down the ladder of downward mobility and humbly serving others, sooner or later, every single believer who is paying the price of following Jesus is going to have to do business with a guy named Pity. His first name is Self. Self Self-pity. Here's how Paul introduces the subject. Let's jump into the scripture here today. Philippians chapter two, this is all after just kind of our our review of last week. And and forgive me because last week is is just a monumental section of scripture. It is is classic and and I think we needed to pause and, and honor that. Philippians two verse Verses 12 through 14, we're going we're gonna, to uh, major on 14 and following, but Paul says this, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, remember, he's just talked about us having the mind of Christ. And so when he says obeyed, he, he's saying you need to obey in that way. Don't have your mindset anymore. Have the mind of Christ. That's what he's talking about. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, not just when I'm there, But now much more in my absence. I've heard stories about you guys. Continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And and latent in there, in that one little sentence, is this understanding that we are not just saved to be saved and now we're saved for for all times. We are saved to serve. Our salvation gets worked out in in us serving others and, and, and doing all of that. Verse 13. For it is God who, what? Who is working in you. He's working in you to do something. He's he's working in you to change you, to make you more like him. And if we're ultimately going to become like him, then we're going to become like him in how we live and how we live has an outward service in, in touching others. For it is God who is at work within you to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. What is God's purpose at this point? God's purpose, as as stated clearly in Scripture, is, is our world is in a fallen state. I need to restore our world to right relationship with me. It's God who's working in you to help fulfill his purpose. 
And so that means you have a part to play in all of that. Then he says this, and this is the part that says, if all of us get on that page, this would be awesome. But then pay attention because, verse 14, everything you do in relation to that, do everything without grumbling, complaining, or arguing. In verse 14, Paul says, once you have it figured out, once you've figured out the ladder that you're going to descend, that God's called you to descend, once you commit yourself to doing it, once, once you get out and start paying the price for doing it, guess what's going to happen? You may, in time, start having an overwhelming desire to complain. You understand what complaining is, right? For our purposes today, some synonyms for complaining uh, are are grumble, right? Uh, One is murmur. Um, You know, that's kind of an outward expression of how how our complaining goes. We don't outwardly complain. We like to, as Christians, we like to murmur, murmur, right? You say, well, I don't know what the word murmur means. Well, the word murmur itself Uh, sort of just kind of sounds like what it means. The word was made famous in the Old Testament when the Israelites were journeying uh, from Egypt to the promised land. The Bible uses this word a lot. Uh, God would would do a miracle to help them in some way, uh, to meet uh, their need in a miraculous way, and the people would be deliriously happy about what God is doing. God, you're an awesome God. And then they would go along a little further and they would forget about God's wonderful provision. And so the Bible says that they would get in little groups, and if you pass by those groups, you would hear them murmuring. I'm sick of manna. Murmur, 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 murmur. I'm sick of quail. Murmur, murmur, murmur. Can't anyone get a decent meal out here in the desert where there is no shops and no, no growing things? Murmur, 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 you know? One time in the New Testament, Jesus attended a party that was thrown for a group of tax collectors and marketplace really, really notorious sinners is that what they actually were. And the self-righteous Pharisees uh, saw Jesus walking into the party. Afterward, Jesus walks by and he hears them murmuring about him, complaining about why is he, why is he spending this time with the, with the sinners, you know? Jesus caught them murmuring under their breath. You want, you want to understand it in, in a present day time, uh, uh, every once in a while, some of you who are parents, you know what this is like because you ask your kids to do something. And they say, yeah, dad, yeah, mom. And as they walk away, you, you hear, <laughs> what are they doing? They're murmuring under their breath. And if they're lucky, you won't knock them upside their head, Right? Because you understand, this is murmuring is not appropriate. Now, when, when you think about murmuring, uh, complaining, it, it's, it's kind of a cowardly form of protest because uh, courageous protesters will, will face, face the things, you know, straight up, right? Uh, but murmurers are a little bit different. And most complainers today, especially us Christians, when we're complainers, uh, we, you know, we, we protest under our breath, kind of in muffled tones, behind the scenes, with somebody else uh, uh, that, that, is, that is feeling like we're feeling. And, and, and in the middle of that, we want to try to keep from being caught. And so we murmur a little bit. You don't ever want to get caught murmuring in the workplace, right? And so what employees do is they, they murmur with one another, and then the boss walks up, and what happens? Silence. We're not talking about anything, you know? Maybe an illustration of how this happens in the church would help us to understand, uh, you know, what, what Paul's trying to address here. One of the most important positions in any church uh, is, is the, the challenge that comes when someone decides that they're going to lead a group of people. And this happens in all different kinds of ways. Right now, there are teachers in our children's program that are leading groups of kids. Uh, Friday night, there were youth leaders who were leading groups of youth. Uh, we've been signing up over the last couple of weeks uh, for community groups where, where people go and someone takes the time to lead groups of people down a, a journey and a walk of relationship and following Christ uh, and, and all of that. And when when you're somebody who is leading a group of people, uh, when you consider uh, the huge, the large chunk of time in your life 
that it takes to do that, investing in the lives of other couples or other singles. And let's, let's be honest, it takes time. It takes no to say, it takes saying no to other things that you want to do in order to do that. My wife and I, she, my wife sitting over here and my son Justin and his wife Anna are, are, are sitting next to, uh, I can't tell you how often we will say to Justin or Anna, hey, why don't you come over? We're going to do something here, uh, with the family on this night. And they'll say, we'd like to do that. Can we pick another night? Because we're leading a small group that night or we're a part of a small group that night and we, we need to be there because we, we love that group of people and we want to invest, you know, they invest in us and we invest in them and there's, can I just say, there's time investment that goes into leading other kinds of people, right? Uh, praying for them, uh, preparing to lead them, counseling them, confronting them, loving them. There's all these things that go into them. It's like, it, it's kind of like being a spiritual parent, and those of you who are new parents, I, I, you understand very clearly how much time and energy it takes in, into doing that, how much emotional and how much all of this is. It's an awesome responsibility. And because of all of that, you get to see some great things happen in people's lives. It, it feels wonderful. Some of the things you experience, some of the, some of the newness of things, walking through them in hard times, you, you feel so close to them. There's all of these great things. And there are times when you're leading other people that you just feel like singing, I've got the joy, 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 joy of God down in my heart. It is great. But then it's not uncommon for that same leader to sometime later want to sing, take this job and give it to some other leader because why? Because you've had a tough day at work. Because you're behind in preparation for what you're doing. Because your kids now are sick that day. The group is coming over in an hour. Everything is in chaos. And so you, you start murmuring. Some of, some of us, let, let, let's be real frank, let me be just real pointed. Some of us who are in this place today, uh, we've heard the message from Philippians that Paul had last week in taking on the mind of Christ and serving others. And in years gone by, we've been in a place where we've been invested in that. But because of some of the things that go on in this world around us, here's, here's the real truth. We got to the place where we started murmuring and we ended up abdicating our positions of service. We just left it all behind. It started with grumbling and complaining. And today we're, we're, not, we're not really invested anywhere giving anything significant. And we kind of think, yeah, I've been there. I've done that. It didn't happen the way I wanted, and now, now I'm just going to kind of walk through things. That's just one illustration of what happens to every single Christian who really chooses to pick up the cross and start carrying it and serving in some little way. We get our perspectives blurred. Even after we've committed, and, and, then, and, and because things don't go the way we want or we expect we're suddenly not so willing to sacrifice. Our values get fuzzy. Our outlook on everything gets just a little bit hazy. Why? Well, sometimes it's because of the busyness of life. Sometimes it's because of the craziness of life. Sometimes, let's just be honest, we, we all do this, I do this. Sometimes it's just because we get a little selfish and wanting things our way, on our time, in, in our preferences. And when, it, when any of those kinds of things happen, we begin with grumbling and complaining and we end with abdicating. Before you know it, no longer are we fixing our gaze on this incredibly inspiring downward example of Jesus Christ as our example, who stepped out of heaven and suffered the cross. Instead, we start to look around us at other casual Christians, low-cost Christians, and even non-Christians at times and say, well, you know, they're not involved in that way. Why do I have to suffer and serve in that way? 
We, we say, what a life people around us have. No cares, no, no real worries. I mean, they can just do life and just come to church and leave and, and not be a part and just kind of enjoy things, right? No real kingdom concerns, no, no crosses that they have to bear. What, what a life they have. They aren't losing sleep over lost souls. They, they aren't heavy hearted when there's not enough moms to serve in the nursery to impact the kids and impact the parents. They, they don't worry about young people, young believers getting Disciple, what do they care? They don't have to worry. It's just kind of a stress-free existence of being saved. They aren't contemplating giving another large chunk of hard-earned money to another expansion uh, program that the church has got going on. They aren't agonizing over temptation, saying no to sin through clenched teeth. They aren't grappling with greed and lust and lies and all of those kinds of things. Uh, what, what are they doing? Well, they're just, it kind of feels like they're piled on a sled going full speed down an icy slope, uh, you know, uh, headed who knows where, but they're having fun. And they're waving and they're smiling and they're going, hey, come join us. It's, there's no cares, there's no worries. We're just kind of, we're just kind of riding the wave. Life is short. You only go around once. Eat, drink, and be merry. Don't worry about the stresses of kingdom concerns and all of those kinds of things. I don't want to make this too heavy, but isn't it true that some of us sometimes take our eyes off of Christ and his example of serving others? Isn't it true that sometimes we start to look at casual and low-cost Christians around us and we use that as an opportunity to justify the easier way of living the Christian life? It's the day lights out of carrying the cross that I'm carrying, the cross that I'm carrying leads me to murmur and grumble under my breath, eyes kind of darting around because I don't want anybody else to see that I'm, I'm, I'm grumbling. Don't raise your hand, but anybody ever done that? I have. There's a famous psalm where King David murmured about this very thing. Uh, just as we come to a conclusion here today, I want, I want to take a look at that and show you just kind of how King David walked through it. Everybody walks through this at every level. David is somebody who the Bible says had a, had a heart right after God, right? Uh, let me read. I'm going to read uh, portions of this. If you have your Bible, open it up. I'm not sure whether I got all of the, all of the verses on there or not, but uh, Psalm 73, David writes this. He says this, but as for me, my feet had almost, what? Stumbled. Some of us here today, you know, that, that kind of feels, you know. My steps had nearly slipped. Why? For I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. What's he saying? He's saying, I'm not looking right now at God. I've taken my eyes off of him. Right now, he he didn't live after Christ, or he might have said, "I'm not looking right now at Christ." We've lived after Christ, and he's a better, easier example for us to see. I, he, he's essentially saying, "I'm now looking at all of these low cost people around me, these God, these non God followers, and 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 what do I see when I look at them?" He says, I, "I see prosperity in them, the ones who aren't following God." Verse four. Watch what he says now. They have no pangs in their death. Their their body has strength. They they aren't in any trouble. They don't fall prey to to plagues like other people seem to fall. They they, they seem to be doing pretty good. Verse seven. From their callous hearts comes iniquity. What's iniquity? Sin. Falling short of God. Their evil imaginations have no limits. They, 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 you can kind of picture, they, they, they can come up with anything. Boy, it sounds like the world we live in, not the world he lives in. Verse number nine. Their mouths lay claim to heaven and their tongues take possession of the earth. Verse 12. This is what the wicked are like. 
always free of care, they go on amassing wealth. Always free of care. I, you know what? Whatever. I'm not, I don't have any burdens on me. I don't have any responsibilities on me. I'm not going to sign my name up to do anything because I don't commit to anything. I'm just kind of free of care and I'll go about uh, uh, amassing wealth. What's my primary concern? I just want to make sure I have enough money for me for now and for later. And if I have that, then everything will be good and eventually I'll retire and, and, and that'll be good in life because I have no cares. I have no real concerns. I have nothing I'm really committing to. So Certainly not the cause of God. David says, I'm telling you, I have a problem with this. David says, poor little old me. Murmur, 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 murmur. Verse 13. Surely, listen to what David says. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. Those are two big words there, in vain. What is he saying? He's saying, here I am breaking my back to follow God, doing everything I know to yield my life to God, everything I know to say no to sin in my life, and no to distraction, and no to everything around me. I am breaking my back. And, I'm, and so, so I'm keeping my heart pure. I'm keeping my hands clean. And what is it gaining me? Seems like I'm doing all of that in vain. Because look at them. They're, do, they're doing so awesome. Verse 14, all day long I have been afflicted and every morning brings new punishments to me. Murmur, 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 murmur. To be frank, he says, I don't really like it. I just don't like it. I wish, wish I could be like the people out there. Uh, it, it, it seems like it's not worth it. And so he grumbles and he complains. And then suddenly David takes control of his mind. Verse 16, look at how the worm turns. When I thought how to understand this, it was too painful to me. And some of us have felt like that, right? Until I went into the sanctuary of God. And then I understood their end. You see, suddenly it became clear to David. He understood where their sin-laden, toboggan, snow-riding was really headed. So follow now what he says in verses 18 and following. Surely you place them on a slippery ground and you cast them down to ruin. How suddenly are they destroyed, completely swept away by terrors. They are like a dream when one awakens. When you arise, Lord, you will despise them as fantasies. What what, what does that mean? These people might look like they're doing fine. And and I'm going to even venture to say, I think that there's a lot of people in a lot of churches who call themselves Christians who look like they're doing fine. But they're on icy rock, potentially falling off slippery places. We've seen it in a lot of places. We've seen a lot of people fall. We've seen it in government, in athletics, in businesses. We've certainly seen it in the church, not just in people who are attending, but in people who are leading churches. People who are flying high. Their lifestyle seemed to be so good for, to us, even, even, even in times we've become envious of them. And we thought, here I am carrying my cross, serving God, keeping my hands clean, keeping my heart pure, following a downward ladder, submitting myself, serving others, giving of myself to others. And all of these people around me uh, seem to be excelling and not having to have a care in the world and not having to sign up to do something for some period of time. If you haven't seen enough people falling off the rocks, check your news feed. It's there every day. David says, oh, oh, I see. Just because someone seems to be on the increase now, they could be a heartbeat away from a fall. And then in verse 19, 
how suddenly they are destroyed, completely, completely swept away by terrors. David realizes in verse 23, and, and, or, uh, this in verse 23, and, and now for David, the murmuring stops, and he starts going down a different direction. Listen to what he says. Nevertheless, forget all of that. Nevertheless, I am continually with you, talking to God. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all of those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all of your works, God. Here's, here's the point of, of where I'm going today. That is what we need to turn to. If we could just keep our eyes fixed on the incredibly inspiring example of Jesus, what would happen? What would happen to everybody in this place? I think every leader in this place would lead with energy and vision. Every Christian would she serve with joy because they would be serving like Christ, their Savior. Every giver would give sacrificially and cheerfully, just as Jesus gave. Every evangelist would, would witness to, to people around them boldly. Why hold back? Because I'm sharing with people the truth. Singers and musicians would play without reservation and without regard for any recognition from anybody else because they would be worshiping first and foremost to God. The cause of Christ would advance with, with, with presence and with power in our world. And Christ would increase in every single believer's life. Christ would increase in the church. And we, as a body, would become a picture to the world around us that would cause them to want to come in and be a part. But a lot of it comes down to where are we? Where are you going to fix your gaze? Because when we get our gaze off of Christ, we, we tend to start grumbling and complaining. And it leads us to abdicate our serving. But when our eyes are on Christ, we are inspired forward. Paul says it this way. We, we just read how David said it. Do all things without uh, complaining and disputing. Why? that you may come, become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. You're different. Holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ. That is, we're going to have some rejoicing here, but one day Jesus is going to return. And on that day, we're, we're going to be so proud and so excited about how we served him. We're going to rejoice as he returns and we know that he sees us and he's going to be excited about us. So that Paul says, I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain and labored in vain. Yes. And if I am being poured out as a drink offering, and let me pause and ask the question, would you say that your life today is being poured out as a drink offering to God? Or would you say you're following the path of far too many low-cost Christians who are okay with doing things that don't cost them anything? If I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith. I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason, you also be glad and rejoice with me. Crossroads family, it's been a privilege to be a part of the pastoral team that has been here to serve this family through the years because this concept has been proved out in the lives of so many people around this place. 
It is for that reason that we have seen God bless us and, 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 and change lives all around us through his spirit. Let's commit again individually and corporately to doing this together, to advance the cause of Jesus Christ. Let's keep our eyes on him and let's sign up for the sacrifice of serving him and bringing him glory. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, one more time as we can come close to ending one of our corporate times of worship, I want to pause and thank you for your word that leads us and guides us into all truth. Thank you for your word that challenges us to take the next step. You've not called us to something average. You have called us to something great. You've called us to representing you here on this earth. And that means for all of us that there is an investment that we need to make. But it's worth it because the payout in the end is you. And so we thank you for your word today. Amen. I want to ask you, with everybody's heads bowed and your eyes closed today for just a moment, Number one, I want to talk. Paul's writing here to believers. I want, I want to ask you, are you here today and at some point in the past, maybe long time past, maybe recent past, you, you committed like, like to last week's message of following Christ and serving, even sacrificially serving. But is it possible that around this place there have been some of us maybe even many of us who we allowed complaining and grumbling to walk in and maybe it's even gotten to the place of abdicating that journey of service. We're, we're not involved serving. We're not today sacrificing. We're just kind of doing what we're doing the way we want to do it. If that's you today, this isn't about guilt at all. This is about understanding and about who we can be. I want to ask you where you're at. This is, a, this is a just where you're at right now. Would you pause and recommit your life to act of service and looking at the example of Jesus? Right now with him, would you do that? Would you call out to him and say, God, that's me. I, I need to take that step. I need to find my place of serving, of giving, of sacrificing today. Would you do that where you're at all around this place? While you're taking a moment to do that, I want to pause and, and, and talk to some others. If you're here today and, and you go, oh, man, I'm not today a follower of Christ. Every one of our services, there's, there's, there's folks that, that fit into that situation. And, and there may be a lot of reasons for that. You haven't gotten to the place of making that decision. Here's what you're doing right now. You may not even realize it. But right now, you're putting your faith in yourself to be a good enough person to make it through this life and through eternity. You, you're, you're, you're thinking that you can do that. Now, intuitively, you know it's not possible. You know you can't, and none of us can. But the Bible says it this way. The reason why you know it is because all of us have sin that comes into our life. And that sin separates us from God. There's a punishment for sin that's called death in eternal separation from God. God is holy. He can't have sin around him. And so, so when there is sin, that separates. The sin has to be dealt with. That, de that dealing with that is death and separation. And if you've been trying to deal with that sin on your own, you're putting your faith in yourself to do it. The only way you can deal with it is your death and your separation from God. But the story of Scripture, and this is the story that Paul was talking about last week, is that, that Jesus stepped out of heaven, lived a sinless life. Because he lived a sinless life, when he died on a cross, he paid the price for sin 
He didn't have to pay it. He didn't owe it because he had no sin. And now he can take that price and offer it to you as forgiveness. And today, what you have to do is stop putting your faith in you and start putting your faith in Jesus. And so I want to ask you around this place, is that you today? Are you ready to stop putting your faith in yourself to be good enough? You can't do it. None of us can. Stop putting your faith in yourself. You can pay the price, but the price is death and eternal separation from God. Let Jesus' price that's already been paid come to you. Put your faith in him and then start to follow him. If that's you here today, all around this place, uh, you, you say, how do I do that? Put your faith in him. Pray a prayer where you're standing right now and just say, God, uh, forgive me. Jesus, forgive me. I, I, I'm not gonna trust in me anymore. And I know I'm not good enough to deserve it. None of us are good enough to deserve it. God, Jesus, forgive me of my sins. You died on a cross for me. I'm putting my faith in you and your, your, your act, your death. You're paying my price and not myself. Forgive me. Scripture tells us that when we do that, he is faithful to forgive us and cleanse us of our sins and make us right before God. And then you stand in the place of being saved to be free from your sins, but not just for yourself, but then being saved to serve. And now the call for you is to follow God. I want to encourage you, if you prayed that prayer today, before you leave this place, tell somebody that you prayed the prayer. Uh, stop and tell one of the altar workers that's going to be down here in just a minute. Stop at our connection point out in, in the atrium and tell somebody that you prayed that prayer. They want to, they want to talk to you, pray with you, uh, give you kind of a next step on, on where to go with that. Now we're going to conclude our service in the way we always do. I'm going to ask our altar workers to come down here to the front to be ready to pray with people. And if you're here today... Let me start. If you're here today and you have a need that's in your life or a need in somebody else's life around you, don't leave this place before you lay that need at the altar. Don't leave this place before you let one of the leaders pray with you, pray for you before you go. If you're here today and you're on a journey and that you, you want to serve God and you need his help as, as you follow that sacrificial spot, come down here today and call out to God and say, God, help me. Help my attitude. Help my strength. Help me find the right place. Don't leave this place before you do it. Our worship team is going to come and they're going to lead us in one last song before we do. As they, as they do, the altars are open. I want to invite you to come. God bless you as you do so.
Father, that's our prayer today. Would you help us to keep our eyes on you as we look for a way to go, to keep our eyes on you and to follow in your direction, so that we can serve you and lift you up. Father, as we walk through our every day, help us to be ever mindful of how you look at our lives, that, that there are people all around us today who don't know you the way we know you, and that you have put us in their lives. There, there may not be other believers around them, but you have put us in their lives so that we can love them, so that we can share our stories with them, so that we can invite them to a place uh, like this where they can hear your word preached. Lord, in, in some way, you have, you have put us there so that we can help them to come and hear about you, maybe even put their faith in you and see their lives changed for now and for eternity. Lord, through our lives, be lifted up for you deserve all the praise and we give you all the praise. Amen and amen and amen. Crossroads, thanks for joining us this weekend for our online services. It's a pleasure to be with you, but we would love to meet with you in person. Whether you've been here before but haven't been in a while, or you've never visited either of our campuses, feel free to reach out to me so that I can give you all the details on when we meet, on where we meet, on service times, every Sunday, 9 o'clock, 10.30, 11. We want to see you face to face. Thanks. God bless.